for our story today, we're dealing with John Doe versus Pomona College. This is a, co a case dealing with a student who was disciplined by a college under a Title IX violation for alleged sexual incidents, but the case fell apart and the student is suing the college for violating his rights in the due process issues when it came to the hearing that he was given and for having his college um, um, re revocation um, made without proper due process. So we're going to read a little bit about this decision and see what the courts have to say and why due process is important to people who are alleged of sexual assault violations. So let's get story started on this. A college student was successful in obtaining a writ overturning his college finding that he had engaged in sexual misconduct against another student. Pursuant to the civil code procedure, the court issued a writ also awarded the student $130,000 in attorney's fees. The college challenges the fees award, concluding there's no abuse of discretion. We affirm. In March 2015, John Doe was a student at Panoma College and Jane Rowe was a student at Pitzer College. The two colleges are part of a consortium known collectively as Claremont Colleges. On May the 6th, on March the 6th, 2015, the two met up at a party and went back to the dorm room. This was not their first date. The night before, they had kissed and groped one another. This time, however, there was more aggressive sexual conduct. The parties dispute whether Roe consented to the act. Doe maintained the act was consensual. Rose says it was not and that she had submitted to Doe's advances because of post-traumatic stress disorder caused by a prior incident, which caused her to freeze up and remain silent throughout the incident. Eight months later, on November the 10th, 2015, Roe filed a Title IX complaint with the college alleging that Doe committed sexual misconduct. Eight months later. Okay. The college appointed investigators to assess the merit of the complaint. In doing so, the investigators applied the definition of sexual misconduct policy from the 2015 sexual policy. After interviewing 20 witnesses, how are there 20 witnesses to this? That's what I want to know. The investigators issued a 54 page finding enough evidence to move the allegation forward. Based on the investigators report, the Title IX coordinator issued Doe a statement of an alleged policy violation, finding him guilty of violating the policy against non-consensual sexual intercourse. On April 22, 2016, Doe filed a request for review with the external adjudicator appointed by the college to evaluate any challenge to the Title IX finding. Doe asked the eternal external adjudicator to overturn the coordinator's finding and direct investigators to conduct additional investigation, including asking Roe several follow-up questions regarding prior statements that were inconsistent regarding whether or not she had consented to the acts. On April 29th, the external adjudicator declined to overturn the findings and rejected the request to pose more questions, finding the procedures more appropriately provide how questions that can be asked at the hearing. On May the, two, on May the 18th, 2016, the external adjudicator conducted an evidentiary hearing. At the outset of the hearing, the external adjudicator knew that Doe had the right to pose questions of any of the witnesses presented and the right to submit questions for complainant Roe, but they would have to be done in advance. Because Roe elected not to attend the hearing, either personally or remotely, and Doe had not submitted any questions in advance to be posed to Roe, and the external adjudicator refused Doe's earlier questions to pose Roe as part of a continued investigation, Doe had no opportunity whatsoever to question Roe. So no ability to confront the witnesses against you. That sounds pretty shady to me. On May the 27th, 2016, the external adjudicator issued a 24-page document entitled Factual Findings and Decisions. Although the adjudicator found that Doe genuinely believed that Roe had consented, the external adjudicator nevertheless ruled that the act was non-consensual because under the policy there has to be a clear showing of consent to engage in each of the alleged sexual acts. The adjudicator accordingly concluded that Doe had violated the policy against non-consensual sexual intercourse and imposed a two-month suspension. On June the 16th, 2016, Doe appealed the external adjudicator's ruling on several grounds, including that he was denied any opportunity to examine Roe either directly or indirectly. Yes, ability to confront your witnesses against you, always good for due process. On July the 25th, 2016, the Dean of Students rejected Doe's appeal and affirmed the ruling. With regard to the claim that he was denied the right to question, the Dean of Students ruled that the 2016 misconduct policy, which supplemented the procedural framework, does not require the complainant to proceed in the hearing. Hmm. An external adjudicator allowed Doe to question witnesses who were at the hearing. Well, that's definitely the same thing, right, guys? I have the ability to question people who are there, so that's definitely the same thing as questioning people who are not there, right? Lord, that sounds just awful. Because the external adjudicator filed the appropriate proceedings, the dean 
reason that he was not denied a fair hearing. I disagree. On 2016, in 2016, Doe filed a petition for a writ of administrative mandamus against the college and filed an amended petition. In the operative amended petition, Doe alleged he was denied a fair hearing and the college finding of sexual misconduct was not supported by substantial evidence. He sought a writ to set aside the findings and sanctions, and he does not seek monetary damages. So he's going to a court to issue a writ of mandamus. A writ of mandamus is telling uh, is a court issuing a lower body telling them to do something. So court, I want you to order them to do something. That's a writ of mandamus. So let's see what they say. Following two rounds of briefing, the trial court issued a 22-page order granting the petition on the grounds that Doe had been denied a fair hearing, as I would think. The 2016 policy, which supplemented the procedural framework, purports to provide the accused with two opportunities to indirectly pose questions. Namely, the accused could ask the, ask the inter external adjudicator overturn Title IX finding and to outline further investigatory steps, having taken investigatory steps, and the accused could submit questions for the external adjudicator to ask the complaint at the hearing. Rather than allow Doe either, either opportunity, the external adjudicator requested, rejected Doe's request to have investigators pose additional questions as part of a continuing investigation because it was more appropriate to do question it at the hearing. But when Roe elected not to attend, faulted Doe for not submitting questions in advance. So basically, yeah, you can't have it both ways, right? It's like, you submitted questions. It's more appropriate for the hearing. She's not at the hearing. You should have submitted questions in advance. Yeah, that seems like a violation of due process to me. The net result of the rulings the court found was to deny Doe any opportunity to question Roe directly or indirectly, and thus to deny Doe a fair hearing. The court went on to find this denial was prejudicial. Knowing that the question of Roe's consent turned chiefly on the credibility of the only two participant witnesses, as one would imagine, the court found it entirely unclear whether the external adjudicator would have made the same credibility determination had Roe been questioned, especially in light of the inconsistent statements. Right. So if there are only two people and one of them is making inconsistent statements, that would be an issue of credibility. As you're weighing that, you would want to consider that potentially, it seems to me. Following the entry of the judgment, Doe filed a motion seeking attorney's fees of $255,000. That is fees of $127,000 with a multiplier. Following a round of briefing, the court issued an order and actually awarded $130,000. So they didn't award the multiplier, but they just rounded up. Okay. The court notes that under the section, a successful party is entitled to attorney's fees if he shows that the action resulted in enforcement of an important right affecting public interest, a significant benefit has been conferred on the general public, and the necessary financial burden of private enforcement are such to make the award appropriate. Because the college did not dispute that Doe was successful or satisfied the necessary and financial burden, the court's analysis focused on the important right and significant benefit. That sounds like an expensive lawyer. Doesn't sound like that expensive of a lawyer to me, to be honest. $130,000? I mean, by the time you're done with all the discovery and facts and all the fighting and back stuff, I mean, that's a lot of time. So $130,000 in legal fees, I mean, it's a little expensive, but it's not outside the ballpark for what you would imagine for, you know, discovery, going back and forth, you know, different papers, writing different things. I mean, it takes a long time. So these things get expensive. $130,000 sounds about right. The court found that those action enforced an important right of public interest, namely the college student being accused of misconduct. The court also found that those actions had conferred a significant benefit. Although a primary effect of the lawsuit was personal, the court acknowledged it still must assess the significance of any other benefit and the size of the class. Here the court found the college had implemented a policy in merit that deprived Doe of a fair hearing. In light of the student's unwillingness to intervene, the court found that the denial in the Doe case was near unique nor unlikely to reoccur. What's more, the court found it seemed clear the large class of persons are affected by the policy because those actions help to ensure a fair hearing to any future students who might be involved. In Title IX proceedings, the court concluded the action had conferred a significant benefit on a large class of persons. The college proffers two reasons why the trial court nevertheless abused its discretion in concluding those actions concurred a significant benefit upon a large class of persons. First, the college asserts that Doe's lawsuit did not allege any intrinsic defects in the policy and misapplication of the policy in Doe's case arose from a unique set of circumstances unlikely to arise again. That is, the adjudicator's misunderstanding of Doe's right to ask the investigator to ask the follow-up questions. We reject that assertion. Doe's decision not to challenge the 2016 policy itself is relevant because what deprived him of the fair hearing was not the policy but implementation. As noticed above, a lawsuit that focuses on the entity to follow its own rules can confer a substantial benefit. The trial court also reasoned that the reasonable basis for concluding that a denial of fair hearing happened to Doe would reoccur. 
Although the particular circumstances linked to denial in the Doe case may not recur the same way, college's refusal to rectify the denial through its internal appeals process, especially when the denial was specifically called to its attention, demonstrated an insensitivity to due process that was likely to reoccur. The college further assertion that the external adjudicator dean students will not make the same mistake twice ignores the reason that they will not is because of this action. So fair enough. He's basically saying that, look, you guys had every opportunity and you guys were hostile to due process this entire way. So you can't say that we're not hostile to due process because you showed you were hostile. And, you know, it's only because of this that you're not being hostile. So it does provide a broader benefit than his own case. Second, the college contends that Doe did not proffer any evidence to support his position that the action fostered any significant benefit upon a large group of people. No evidence there had been any other sexual misconduct hearings where the complaint failed to show. No evidence that the external adjudicator in this case had presided over the other hearings. No evidence that college students other than Doe had ever been charged with sexual misconduct. And no evidence Doe's case got any press coverage. All Doe proffered in the case was pure speculation. We reject these contentions. Not only do they rest on the premise, which the trial courts has a reasonable basis to reject, that Doe's case was wholly unique and unlikely to reoccur, but they must misapprehend the moving party's burden under section of the law. So basically, there's a couple things that are going on here. First of all, it's saying that, look, some of this is within the trial court's discretion. You're making basically factual arguments, and the trial court said, no, I think this is likely to reoccur. And so the appeals court is saying, Look, the trial court had a finding. They're entitled to discretion. They made some findings. They saw the witnesses before them. They had the trial. We're just the appeal court. We're looking at the law. So if they say that this is their view of it, we're not going to return it because they're entitled to that deference. So that makes sense. Although the moving party may supplant evidence to su su substantiate the significant benefits that the, law the lawsuit confers, the moving party is not obligated to do so. It's enough that the trial court could reasonably conclude significant benefit conferred by the action that would lead a large group of people. We reject the college's further argument that those actions confer no significant benefit upon a large group of people because it did not result in a published decision addressing due process rights. That argument overlooks the reasons why there is no published decision on the merits. It is because Doe won and the college elected not to appeal its loss. We declined to give the college extra credit for its litigation strategy. Nice touch there at the end. So basically saying the reason that this didn't publish is because you guys didn't appeal, but that's not, you know, that's not a good enough reason. So this is your embarrassment and you should you should have that. So yeah, that's that's really that's really good. A little burn there with the extra credit lines. Like you don't get credit for for this not becoming published from your own action. That's a nice little burn. So that is the end of our coverage of the case of John Doe versus Panoma College. We learned a couple things. First of all, as we think, I think we all suspected some of these Title IX hearings are much more of a star chamber kangaroo court than anything that represents a due process. So in this case, the student asked the investigator to ask the person additional questions and the investigator declined on the basis you can ask during the hearing. And then at the hearing, a person declined to appear and said, you should have asked in advance. So the student was awarded no due process. And as the only other person who is a fact witness, the only person who was there, you know, their testimony is relevant. And to the extent they've contradicted themselves, that's relevant too. That's part of due process. So. This student was not given due process, and he challenged it, and he won, and has been awarded some attorney's fees. So good for the court on recognizing that there should be due process in these Title IX hearings. We should take complaints seriously, but at the same time, we should give everyone due process because these are serious allegations. And when the case is as it is here, and the college just ignores it because, you know, hashtag me too, and no one would ever lie, that doesn't go far enough. You can't just run a student out of court because of a statement that is completely unchallenged. So... I think this goes to show the importance of due process, and I hope we will see more decisions like this, and we will certainly cover any further decisions that go to show due process in Title IX hearings. So that's enough for that.